I want to thank you for that introduction and welcome you all to the company of Men Among Machines. <laughs> uh, in uh, puzzling over this uh, material over the last several weeks, I found there were four questions that I wasn't able to answer very satisfactorily, and I think I might as well let you in on what they were. The first one was the obvious one, which was, where would I find the time to think about leisure? And that seems to have amused most, most of my friends as well. Uh, incidentally, it raises the second question, which is whether professors' notions of leisure are enough like anybody else's so that uh, uh, they might say something that had some valid bearing on other people's leisure. Well. My unsatisfactory answer to both these questions was simply that uh, in this profession we can't resist platforms anyway, so uh, I don't pay much attention to uh, those first two. Then I worried a little bit about whether, and particularly at the, uh, during the discussion at the end of last week's talk, I wondered a little bit whether uh, it was possible that self-consciousness about leisure might sometimes be about as destructive as self-consciousness about sex, so they tell me that it might be. <laughs> so uh, my unsatisfactory answer to that one is that's not my field. <laughs> uh, the fourth question I couldn't answer was how do I avoid getting into the middle of the free-for-all that's raging about where society is going in the proverbial handbasket. And um, I can't avoid getting into that. But in case I stick my neck out too far, I've got the same answer as I had for the third one. Namely, it's not my field. <laughs> so uh, with that, uh, the customary word or two about terms, I'm not going to try to pin down a definition of leisure for this talk any more successfully than that was done a week ago. Uh, for us tonight, it can either be the good life or anything else you want to make it. A precise meaning of leisure is not important to my discussion tonight. The term technology, I intend in this talk to uh, be applied in the broadest possible sense that is covering the application of man's knowledge of all kinds and in all contexts so that I'm not adopting a, uh, a narrow view of the word. I'm going to say a little about the word automation mostly so I can avoid it the rest of the talk. Um, supposedly the word automation designates a, a new ingredient which characterizes either the second or the third industrial revolution, depending on who you read. Uh, roughly, of course, we're all familiar with the first industrial revolution applying for the power of men's muscles. And in some way, automation now refers to things that happen uh, involving control and logical processes, things of that kind. Uh, one writer has defined automation in not a bad way, I think. Uh, it has its difficulties, too. Uh, I think it was Peter Drucker who called automation the use of machines to run machines. And maybe that's not bad, I don't know. But the term is pretty vague now. Many people use it in many different uh, meanings, and I will try to avoid the term itself. Well, the thing that, of course, we're all familiar with is the astonishing rate at which technology is moving. Uh, any list would bore you. You know, the atomic age, the space age, we're on its threshold, certainly. We're in the early childhood of the computer age, not much further than that. Uh, we're familiar with the miracles of medical science, and we know that a vigorous attack is being made on the secrets of genetics and uh, uh, possibly on the origins of life. And these things are uh, pretty sobering when you uh, consider the implications. 
I think the thing that's fairest to say about it is that it's only the beginning, that we're facing not only a period of continued change, but probably more and more change all the time. I'm reminded of a joke I won't tell, but the punchline goes, you've got 30 minutes to learn to live underwater. <laughs> and in some ways, uh, a change is the thing we've got to learn to live with. It's, in, it's at least as inevitable from here on in as our standard list that has death and taxes on it. I think we've got to consider that uh, <clears throat> that we're even going to need new technology in order to live comfortably with change as the standard rather than uh, with reasonably constant environments. Well, the problem that one of the major problems that gets posed is not really new. It's about equivalent to the problem of whether Adam should have eaten the apple. You see, we're talking about the fruit of the tree of knowledge, and that's what's ahead of us. It's more fruit, and uh, the tree of knowledge has got more branches. This technology, which makes possible uh, uh, an increase of leisure, and which enlarges the individual's freedom of choice with respect to the enjoyment and utilization of that leisure, this very same technology generates a number of paradoxes, and some of them are rather monstrous. As far as this talk goes, I must exclude the threats of being blown off the globe or, or being crowded off it. Uh, these are things which in varying degrees are rather serious problems. I, I exclude them from this talk not because they're unimportant, but life would be already quite unbearable if we had to offer solutions to these before we ever examined any other human problems. So if you'll forgive me, I'm going to exclude uh, the bomb and overpopulation from this talk. The next thing, probably in order of importance, is the remarkable paradox that, uh, in the fact that everybody seems to grant that technology upgrades the labor force, it puts a premium on skill and intelligence, but it may cause, and apparently does cause, increasing unemployment. This unemployment may be mainly among workers that are not easily retrainable or removable geographically, and among unskilled youth who are joining the labor force without adequate education or skills to take part in it. Uh, I'm going to come back to that problem. It's clear there are many things related to it. Uh, we hear the problem of the dropouts from school. It's certain that a fairly large part of our unemployed labor at this time are uh, uh, coming, are associated with the dropout problem. The next thing that you hear about is that uh, technology degrades and dehumanizes man. Uh, there are two shades of this opinion. One is that with machines, man will become a mere pusher of buttons. And then there's the worse view, which is that the machines will run him, and that's that's somehow worse than that he's a mere button pusher. I will come back to that one, I hope. Um, some critics uh, talk about over-organization and brainwashing. The argument is that uh, these will destroy man's capacity for freedom and, incidentally, of course, also his capacity to enjoy leisure. I doubt that I can say much about those in this talk tonight, over-organization and brainwashing, perhaps a little. Then there's some more things we hear that are reasons why man will be unable to enjoy this leisure. In one article that I read, these two reasons were given together. One, that he can't enjoy leisure because he'll be unemployed, and the other is he can't enjoy it because he'll be moonlighting. 
and I find a little difficulty, a little difficulty giving adequate uh, feel, getting a feel for what this man really means. So he'll be too busy to have leisure because he'll need a second job, was that implication. Um, another one is that he'll be loaded down with gadgets from Abercrombie Fitch, and really the best things in life are free, and there was some reference made to that last week. And then, in this same kind of criticism, what you find is that even if the others won't spoil his leisure, man is too empty anyway. And that's about the way I read it. Man is too empty to enjoy leisure anyway. And then we get the visions of mass boredom. And I expect to have something to say about that. We hear, you know, alienation, identity, conformity, and so on. <clears throat> on the question of conformity, there is one writer, a rather eminent uh, electronic physicist, uh, Dennis Gabor. The spelling is the same as you know who. Uh, <laughs> uh, he writes rather well on this subject of uh, uh, where are we going. But I have to lift this quote from him. In the present, we can see more simple happiness of the common man than has ever existed in the world. Now, one can believe that and still not believe that we're in utopia. That is, I, I, I think the point is one has to admit that there are many, many things to criticize in the world. But given a sense of proportion about it, I think it's also fair to accept the statement that I just quoted from Gabor. Incidentally, on the question of conformity again, <clears throat> he quotes Priestley. And Priestley asked whether the cinema was any worse than the cartwheel around the village idiot's neck as a Sunday entertainment. Now, I think that's an interesting question. Is the cinema worse than putting a cartwheel around the village idiot's neck for your entertainment? Just think about it. At this point, let me return to the question of dislocations of employment. To me, that problem is real enough and pressing enough. Uh, every time the unemployment figures are published, we have one more indication. I think myself that in the nature of things, this problem ought to be reasonably solvable. And there have been a number of fairly constructive uh, thoughts offered on it. Actually, Mr. Walter Ruther represents a, a position with respect to automation and technological uh, uh, progress, which is, I think, overall a generally constructive position. And it's a position which is widely shared outside the ranks of labor. He ties the unemployment, first of all, to insufficient economic growth. We hear this, we hear about wanting a tax cut, and there seems to be pretty good agreement that we ought to have rather greater economic growth than we're getting. Mr. Ruther also cites the unfilled needs of the nation, and it's pretty easy to make a good list of unfilled needs that I think most of this audience might grant were unfilled. Needs in education, in health, housing, urban redevelopment, recovery of distressed areas, highways, conservation, community facilities. And if that isn't enough to keep us occupied, what about the less fortunate peoples abroad whom we might help rather more than we do? So this, in a sense, is paradoxical that we should find ourselves with a large unemployment problem and at the same time with a rather long list of things that many people feel we're not getting done. Ruther asks for what he calls a fair sharing of the social gains and social costs of technological progress. This raises the question, what is fair? And is it a moral problem at all? It may be, but one suspects it won't get settled on, on a moral basis. But it's probable, I think it's probable that the question of the sharing of the social costs and gains will be set, the, that is the shares will be set by the needs of the economy itself. And 
somehow a solution to that, to that technological unemployment is something that uh, many people are going to want to see, and it is going to require something like a sharing of the social costs and social gains. Incidentally, Ruther makes a case for education as well as training and retraining. Uh, he, interestingly enough, includes a suggestion for increased study of the humanities in order that labor may better enjoy its leisure. And you see here a possibility of interpreting that the humanities constitute a part of the technology for leisure. I find that rather interesting. At this point, I'd like to, uh, to leave the, the employment thing. I, I'm really not the person to give a persuasive story on it. My own feeling about it is one uh, of general optimism that it is solvable, and I hope we're intelligent enough to solve it. But I don't want to minimize the problem. It is with us already. At this time, I'd like to give you uh, a brief sketch of the modern history of the computing field, and for several reasons. One is that it's this part of the technology which in, which in many ways symbolizes the whole of it to many of the public. This will also illustrate the rate at which technological development is taking place. It will also help me perhaps to illuminate slightly the question of man's relation to the machine, which is an important part of the problems we've raised. And perhaps the last and best reason of all is that this is the field that I've been in and am involved in personally and can uh, speak about with the greatest, uh, I think the proper word is authority. Well, it's been just about 18 years since the beginning of what one would call the modern acceleration of computing developments. Uh, this started with an idea, really. The idea that you will hear and have heard about is the idea of stored program computers. And I won't go into a deep technical discussion. Basically, the notion here is that the Steps which the machine will carry out are themselves coded in symbols which are stored in the machine in exactly the same way that uh, data uh, and results are stored in the machine. And this leads to a very, very powerful, uh, uh, ultimately a very powerful repertoire for such machines. This was a revolutionary idea just about 18 years ago. Now, these past 18 years are divisible rather roughly, but uh, nicely enough for my purposes, into three periods, just about six years each. And I will talk about the three six-year periods. The first half dozen years of those 18 were really spent largely getting anything to work as a machine. That is, during those six years, we produced a handful of functioning machines along these lines. The promise was great. Uh, the motivation was largely to do certain large problems in mathematical physis physics. The applications to other areas were already clear to many people. But those first six years were spent struggling with components and circuits, reliability, getting a machine to work well enough to do something with. Uh, in those days, we, we built one of those machines at the Rand Corporation. I understand it's still running. Um, other machines were built uh, in universities, at the Institute for Advanced Study, and government laboratories. But this was a handful. The next six years saw, of course, faster and more powerful components. This kind of development goes on continually. It saw computing machines enter into a phase of commercial manufacture that is no longer being made exclusively in laboratories and universities, being made in an attempt to sell them and hopefully make money. 
which didn't happen for quite a while, but they did make them and sell them commercially. This was a period of wide penetration of computers into scientific and engineering computation. It was a period in which something more than the most rudimentary uh, devices became available for uh, input and output from these machines. Up until that time, uh, input-output facilities had been uh, almost ne next to nothing. Uh, it was a period of uh, beginning development of programming tools and languages, and uh, even a few ventures into commercial applications of computers, that is, applications in insurance and other places in the business world, mostly experimental, but there were these ventures. Uh, this was uh, the period in which the numbers of machines around went from tens to hundreds, and the number of people working in the field went from hundreds into many thousands. That was the second six years. Well, now the last half dozen years, as you would expect, all the things that were going on before have been going on still more. Further development in components, tra the transistor became almost universally important in computers within these past six years. Uh, very broad extension of the computer applications in industrial and business contexts. And so it's these last six years I've seen practically all of that growth in the industrial and business applications. More input-output equipment, uh, the invention of devices which would serve as large files for computers of this type, uh, the beginnings of rem remote data transmission, uh, that is where somebody sits at the end of uh, perhaps some miles or hundreds of miles away from a computing machine and transmits data or instructions, may later get his results back, and gets them transmitted to him on the telephone for all practical purposes. Uh, this is a period in which uh, more progress was made in developing programming languages that would be closer to the problem source than to the idiot language that the machines themselves would be uh, reading directly. Uh, some notion of applications in this period. You all know that the government's going to audit tax returns wholesale. Well, this is what's going to make that possible, whether you're happy or not with it. Uh, problems of resource allocation are being solved routinely on large computers now. Uh, you know something about the use of computers in banking. I couldn't possibly spend this lecture, uh, lengthening this list because you get bored, but the list could go on conceivably all night. The other thing that's interesting about this period, oh, machine tool control, you know, that's one which I shouldn't leave out even now. But the other thing that's interesting in this period is more and more examples of what you would call imaginative applications or applications which appear imaginative. Language translation, pattern recognition, chess playing, the discovery and proof of theorems in mathematics. That's an interesting thing. We think of mathematics as being a rather high type of, of mental activity. Uh, composing and performing music. If you've heard some of that music, you don't have to worry yet. <laughs> but uh, nonetheless, the ideas are interesting. Uh, people are routinely doing very large simulations. They are playing war games with computers. This is a kind of, of more imaginative application than getting your paycheck prepared by a machine. And it is certainly different from what people anticipated when they designed machines for the purpose of solving the partial differential equations of physics. And of course, there's much of this development and research going on now, which will affect the next half dozen years even more in the field. 
Just to summarize just one aspect of this, in these 18 years, what used to be done in one second in a computer now gets done in a tenth of a microsecond, approximately. That is, in 18 years, we've gone to doing, in one second, 10 million of the things we used to do in one second. This is like 100 times faster every five years. That's what's been happening. And there's, by the way, no sign that's going to stop right away. The components that people are playing with now are millimicrosecond components. The name now is nanosecond. There are thousands, million of those in a second. And for some idea of what that means, that's how far light travels in a millimicrosecond. You can call the unit the light foot. So, in terms of speed, this is a rather phenomenal thing. Now, how come you find the computer everywhere? What is there about it that means that it's going to be u ubiquitous? Well, basically, it's not just that the machines do arithmetic. It's true, there's a lot of arithmetic in the world, and uh, uh, we even do some of it ourselves still. But it isn't just for the arithmetic that these machines are going to be found everywhere. It's because they do, rather rapidly, a perfectly arbitrary general form of activity, which can only be called symbol manipulation. That is, now this isn't what Madison Avenue means, and if the term conveys Madison Avenue to you, scratch it. Uh, symbols are manipulated in the sense that uh, well-defined rules will define relations, and sets of symbols will lead to discovery or, or uh, working out of other symbols, that bear a desired relationship to the symbols one started with. And if you think hard, uh, in the real world, we do a lot of symbol manipulation. There are some big differences, though. To the computers, you have to remember that these symbols are being manipulated according to well-defined rules, but without any reference to the meanings of the symbols in the real world. The symbols are devoid of any context in the sense that context refers to real-world interpretation of the symbols. Now, symbolism is possible at many levels. One symbol may stand for a whole big string of symbols, so that in conceptually speaking, I may do something which will later be equivalent to having moved around a whole lot of symbols just by moving one symbol provided that one symbol stood for all the rest of them when I moved it. Now, I don't want to lose you in this. It's not important. The, the point is, the point here is that the multiple levels of symbolism that are possible make this an extremely powerful technology, the ability to move around and alter symbols very rapidly in accordance with pre prescribed rules. But you must keep in mind that the connections with real-world interpretations are supplied by the people, and so are the recipes supplied by people, the manipulative recipes and the meanings which will be attached on both the output and the input sides are the responsibilities of people, and without people doing it, there won't be any real-world connections. What makes the computer so powerful in this is this raw speed and one other thing, the ability now to have very large storage of many symbols um, available for quick recall. And with those two things, raw speed and storage, that's about all it takes to be able to uh, do some fairly awe-inspiring feats with computers. In fact, because man does so many uh, symbol manipulation operations himself, 
he gets a little worried. It's either in a joke or it's seriously that man begins to make up anthropomorphisms about computers, uh, begins to uh, uh, give it a personality and talk about uh, it as if somehow it was a person. Well, I don't think the people who are close even realize that the terms they're using have anthropomorphic connotations, but sometimes their terms sound that way to other people who aren't close. Well, you know, what are the answers to these things? Can the computer do anything I can't do? Well, the answer is yes, if you count the speed, because I certainly can't do things that it does, some of them, at those speeds. Now, in principle, give me enough years and enough pencil and paper, and maybe enough years may mean as many years as the world has been in existence, but in principle, given enough years, enough patience, and if I don't make a mistake, I'm supposed to be able to do what the computer can do. The fact that I can't do what the computer can do is simply that I can't bring to it the speed the computer does. Can the computer come out with results that I couldn't anticipate? Well, again, the answer is yes, for the same reasons, because sometimes you don't know until you work it out, and if I can't work it out myself, I have to say the computer brought me something that I couldn't necessarily anticipate. Well, how do we differ then? Are we the same as computers, but slower and inferior? Well, I'm not going to give you the list of all the things we can do very well that computers don't do well, at least not yet, <laughs> just in case you think I don't want to scare you. I think we differ, though, in uh, one rather important way. Uh, some writers refer to it as self-awareness. Uh, nobody's seriously tried to uh, demonstrate the self-awareness of any computing machine yet that I know of. And I think there's another difference which may be the same thing. I'm not sure, and I'm not enough of a philosopher, psychologist to say. But you know, humans survive in the world be sometimes because they can't tell the difference between symbols and the things the symbols stand for. And computers don't have that problem at all because they're not concerned with what the symbols stand for. I think sometimes that's the very defense humanity has. It's the way he can, he, he can manage to communicate, is the fact that he sometimes can't tell apart the symbols from the things the symbols are meant to stand for. Well, beyond pure anthropomorphisms, you know, people, some of them anyway, tend to see magic in these devices. Whenever a process is complex or hidden, uh, it's rather, I don't know, it's comforting to think about magic and it helps you. Well, there was a cartoon in New Yorker just a week ago, sort of a whimsical thing, which I rather enjoyed. Uh, the one girl is reading the slip of paper to the rest of the girls in the office, so you know what machine they're standing in front of, which, by the way, doesn't look like any of the machines that, that I'm familiar with, but that's another question. And she says, quote, it says I'm the fairest of them all. <laughs> now, just to treat it like a square for the minute, you know, on what basis would that judgment of fairest be rendered? Whose standards would they have been? Uh, perhaps as an, e an exercise, you might try to rationalize that cartoon, that is, construct a situation and a relationship of people to the machines in which this would actually have occurred. Well, fortunately, we take it as whimsy, and it's nice to be able to laugh. And I, and I don't think that one's quite as good as one of my favorites that's got nothing to do with computers. And it goes back many, many years. It's, I think it was Charles Adams, but I'm not sure. It's the one with a pair of ski tracks that separate and go either side of a tree and back again, you know what I mean? Uh, I thought that one was lovely. <laughs> Not all our New Yorker cartoons have to stand for real life, do they? 
Well, let's talk about button pushing now. I think we're ready. Uh, you see, if man is to be used simply as an automaton for the simple act of pushing that button, then nothing could be simpler than to get rid of him in that context and do that mechanically. So this notion that all man has left to do is this unimaginative thing doesn't seem to me to make a lot of sense. We, we, could, atom we could automate, there's, there's a good word, we could automate that task right now. What's overlooked when, we, when people talk about man, the pusher of buttons, is the purpose of element. It's the content, not of the act, but of the reasons for the act. It's the relationship of consequences which are anticipated for that act, and it, the relationship of those consequences to some other purpose. And let me give you a few things to test your notions on. Light switches? Elevator buttons. Do you feel degraded by pushing those buttons? It's true the elevator may bring you low, but I think not in the degrading sense. Uh, these buttons are more symbols of man's mastery, not his slavery. And even in some quarters we we attest to the power of the executive by counting the number of push buttons <laughs> at his desk. These push buttons and the dial on your telephone represent real power. When you push a light switch, it's because you're going to do something with that light, whether it was trivial or important. And that light switch is a symbol, really, of the difference between it and the days when you had gas light or before that uh, kerosene. Man designs these processes. He initiates them. He judges them. He incorporates them into man's world. If they don't perform the way he wants them to perform, he alters them. And if all else fails, he can always pull out the cord. And I find it rather hard for me to fear domination by something that I can shut off by pulling the cord because that's not much of a picture of enslavement as far as I'm concerned. To me, it seems to require a rather deep auto-hypnosis to visualize enslavement by this kind of device. Now, maybe the auto-hypnosis will come from something else, but the fact that we have machinery and we have push buttons does not by any means imply that man is a servant and the machine is the boss. There's just no basis for that. Man will necessarily concentrate increasingly on those tasks for which he is relatively better suited than the machine, and there are many of them. I believe myself that more and more work will be more and more challenging and satisfying and indeed more creative. But, of course, this accentuates again that problem of the unskilled and the uneducated. Let me now get back to leisure, because I've said so much about things that weren't leisure, but may relate to our picture of ourselves. First of all, it's quite obvious that the source of this leisure, if it comes to us, is in the increased productivity in the wide sense. It's, uh, you have to include increased productivity in the home as well as uh, longer life of man, and in that sense, the total productivity, the plant, the business, the home, and longer life, all told. Barring catastrophe, the, I think the situation is very simple. Once man can do more than provide the necessities of life for himself and his dependents, then he can provide more and more and more all the time, and that's why the sky is the limit both literally and figuratively. Well, it's pretty clear then where the leisure is, is to come from. What about the role of technology in the way man chooses to utilize his leisure? We all are aware that providing the instrumentalities of leisure is a rather big business. The things we call the mass media 
you know, movies, theater, TV, radio, newspaper, magazines, and books. I think the age of the paperback is a rather remarkable age. These things not only serve man's leisure directly, with, with material of, of all levels, good, bad, and different, but there's lots of material there to serve his leisure. You might observe that these media also disseminate considerable information about leisure opportunities, so that if somebody is alert and aware, and I'm not going to try to prescribe which of the mass media he should pay attention to, but if he's alert and aware, there are many leisure opportunities that will be brought to his attention, which uh, 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 might or might not be of interest to him. Well, let's go on. The technology brings us not only the mass media, but such mundane things as photography and outdoors activities with, with Amber Crombie and Fitch equipment, if you like, boats and highways and cars, air travel, home workshops, models, hi-fi kits. In Southern California, a swimming pool costs just about what an automobile costs, so there are a fairly large group of people who could, if they wanted a swimming pool, could have it. If I omitted your favorite on this partial list of things that are available to us, why, please forgive me. I omitted my own, incidentally. It just happens that I prefer well, as a first preference on leisure, to spend it playing amateur chamber music. But I think that's, uh, I couldn't find a good way for technology there, but it has something to do with it. The products of the technology provide the widest of choices to more and more people than ever before and at practically all economic levels. There's more time, there are more available materials, more ambitious leisure projects and undertakings are available to people than ever before, if, peop if they're so inclined. They have the means of getting to special activities. I think education is more widespread than ever before, and we'll even take an exception, perhaps, to such as it may be, but it is more widespread than ever before. I don't think ev that ever before has an entire society bought as many books as this one does. Uh, so why do you have to postulate mass boredom? Surely, if there are more choices available and the means to afford them, these things have the possibility of contributing to increased individual freedom. I would say if people are to be bored, bored you'd rather look to their value systems than to the fruits of technology for the reasons. But what's I think even more to the point, it's my right to be bored if I want to. And, and I think that there's some point in standing up for that at times. I really can't accept the picture of a society which is uh, forced to consume products it doesn't really want. People have them, I think, because they want them and can afford them. And besides that, Whose business is it to brand some leisure as being non-constructive or non-productive? How can we be so sure which are good and which bad? And who has the right to put me in a state of guilt and anxiety if I want just to sit? <laughs> it is certain that the public tastes will alter from this new mobility, from that's both an upward and a lateral mobility, uh, as a result of changes in values and changes in opportunities, I say it's certain that public tastes will alter. Whether or not I approve or share the public taste in leisure, I certainly find adequate opportunity to indulge my own tastes, and I'm free within moderate constraints to suit myself. Now, one can state a few simple technological needs with respect to leisure, and they're obvious. I won't belabor them at all. Education, the humanities, social sciences, the study of leisure itself, the study of problems of retirement, these are things which, if studied seriously, will in increase the technology for leisure in a third sense. 
well, I think I ought to wind this up. Uh, on this question of overorganization and brainwashing, I didn't get to that at all. But I really can't accept all the negativity towards humanity that's implied by some of the critics. And as for man's emptiness, I just don't believe it. I spoke a little bit about degradation, and uh, perhaps I ought to leave you with one thought. You know, if you could go back to another period, which one would you choose? Thank you very much, Professor Brown. As, as Professor Brown was talking, a little story began to take shape in my mind. I won't tell you the whole story because it hasn't entirely taken shape, but I can tell you the punchline. Uh, <laughs> well, let, let's consider it an extension of the cartoon that, that Professor Brown mentioned about the, the girl who was the fairest of them all. Uh, she started to go with that machine. <laughs> and, <laughs> and she began running into certain pressures here and there. And each of the people who counseled her on this, this uh, uh, engagement of hers would begin by saying, but my dear, some of my best friends are machines. <laughs> now, <laughs> well, I didn't have long, you know. Uh, but there is, of course, a serious point here. It's hard for those who feel themselves threatened, feel themselves threatened in their jobs, in their essential humanity, and in their essential ignorance of what the, the new technological wonder world is going to be, to like machines very much. Uh, one has, for example, the, the uh, image of those Arts of Bashev drawings that appear in Time magazine and Life and so on, in which the machine becomes a man, and a uh, steam, uh, steam shovel uh, will, will operate with the arms of a man, an enormous furnace becomes the mouth of a man, and so on. And uh, in the popular imagination, uh, as, uh, as Professor Brown was pointing out, the anthropomor uh, anthropomorphic qualities of machines are emphasized while men feel themselves becoming automatons. So we become more like machines, and machines become more like men. And this seems to a great many people a real problem. Uh, it is, at least for me, Professor Brown's achievement in this lecture this evening that he brings us a message of hope. He suggests that the develops, developments in machines are reasonable and natural developments. Uh, he talks optimistically of this, emphasizing both the limitations as well as the abilities of machines, the things that they can't do as well as they can, and uh, suggests to us that we have to accustom ourselves to change as usual, to change as the stable element in society, if you will. Now, I'd be very much surprised if he had not raised in your minds, as he has in mind, any number of questions which you would wish to take up with him. He's agreed to expose himself to your questions and to try to answer them, and uh, we can proceed with that now. Uh, I understand material that I've been reading that the bulk of the effort in research and development is so closely related to the needs of the federal government, particularly in defense areas, that an insufficient allocation of this effort is being made to industry generally, so that it would appear that the new fields that could be opened up, which might uh, afford opportunities for employment, uh, we're being deprived of, and the flow of uh, automation <coughs> equipment uh, is unstemmed so that job opportunities are constantly shrinking. And uh, the volume of leisure time available as a result might get somewhat out of hand. Well, if you're talking about the fact that Detroit has an obvious problem, there's not much to do with computing machines at all, simply that Detroit turns out more cars with fewer workers and people 
who have lived there for 25 years or more are not anxious to go somewhere else or learn another skill. That's, that's one problem. Now, that problem has not much to do with the government as such, except to say that government activity and World War II itself, for example, uh, certainly spawned a large number of developments which have found their way actually into the civilian economy. Now the question is to whether there are enough civilian products which are byproducts of government work is a question that's a little complicated for me. There are people who've made quite a study of this. The question is to whether the rate of civilian product development is fast enough. I'm not sure if that's part of your question. Uh, It could be faster. These things are slow in the commercial uh, context. They're slower than they need to be. Certainly, uh, tax policies have something to do with it, the degree to which people will uh, feel free to uh, throw away old plant or whatever uh, has something to do with it. In the case of the automobile, they're not really making new products. But there are many products coming out and could, and there may, might be very many more in the uh, consumer market, which are uh, completely byproducts of the technology which is being developed largely for the government today. I don't know if that's an answer to your question. The, the overall economic fabric of this is something that uh, you can read about. There, it's something that the president's economists are talking about, and so are others. And it's something that I think Mr. Ruther was quite uh, intelligent about in approaching. I don't think it's a problem of inflation as such, for example. Except the sharing goes across different levels. It would be not only a sharing between employer and employee, but it might be a sharing between government and private industry, et cetera, et cetera. Yes, of course. Uh, I worry myself about the fact that so much of this technology comes uh, only directly at, to f at first in government uh, uh, contexts. But maybe the government is the only agency that can afford this. Yes? Well, I don't know whether you uh, intended a pejorative tone or not in that. Uh, I would rather leave to the sociologists the questions as to whether uh, these are good, bad, or whatever they are. The fact that they exist is certainly a, uh, a consequence of both social security and of uh, the uh, economic system as we now have it. The fact that it could exist, whether it's bad or good, has something to do with its ability to exist in terms of means. Now, uh, if, if this appeals to somebody, then I don't know, again, from my position, as to whether I ought to be a critic. Uh, Dell Webb could make it available, and if nobody took it, That'd be one thing, but if people do take it, that's still another, and I'm not the person to try to put my own values into that one. I think that uh, is a proper place for sociologists and others to consider. Well, I'm backing off again because I'm not sociologist enough to. If they fill a need, they will exist, and more of them. If they don't fill that need, then they won't. Yes? Well, I could beg that one all over the place, but I think I'll just not answer it. <laughs> yes? Uh, what is your uh, concept of the uh, possibility, very soon, uh, around about 40 a week in America? What? Uh, 
we're asked what's the uh, prognostication about a four-day week. And again, you're asking the wrong man. Uh, as to it being possible, yes. And if, if you don't ask me whether it'll be next year or five years or ten, whether it will be possible, of course, technologically. Whether uh, the economic system will permit that uh, in terms of uh, people's choices and preferences, I don't know. Yes? Well, now, now there again, I take issue with your interpretation. The judge didn't rule in, in favor of the machine. The judge ruled in favor of the men who made a law. Yes, I know. Uh, now, let's, let's, let's keep it honest, you see. <laughs> I'm surprised nobody's asked about education. Has anybody got a question on education? Yes. We won't? I apologize, madam. I do have a funny story on this score, though. One of my uh, friends uh, was a pioneer in continental classroom. And I'm reminded of the story because he was here on campus uh, just a few days ago. This was uh, Professor Fred Mosteller of Harvard University. You know it was a god-awful hour of six o'clock in the morning that Continental Classroom was on. Uh, and I heard the other night the following uh, little story about that. It seems that uh, one of, um, uh, the wife of one of Fred's uh, Santa Monica acquaintances was awakened at six o'clock in the morning and she heard Fred's voice in the bedroom. And she got very worried about this and she pulled the covers over her head. What's Freddie doing here? And in my bedroom at six o'clock in the morning. Well, after she was awake enough to catch the drift, she realized what had happened. Her husband was watching Mosteller on Continental Classroom at 6 a.m. on the television and had brought it into the bedroom. I want to say something about education, though, and it's the question of television and mass methods in, in, in education. I have uh, certainly, uh, I, I have no reason to be an obstacle in it. There is something important, though, about education in an era of change. It means that more and more and more we have to concentrate on education as a means of allowing people to meet change, not simply training in a skill, because if we have somebody as an undergraduate today, he's got 40 or more years in the world in a useful way, perhaps more than 40, and we may never get another crack at him, and it doesn't make sense for us to talk to him in terms of a training of, of rather specific things that won't be true in two years or three years, unless you feel the duty of the university is to help a man get his first job and then he can fend for himself. Well, I have the feeling the university has to be the repository of the things which will have a more lasting value, more lasting meaning. And so my, the moral I get out of this, this more and more rapid change on, on education is at least two things. One is we're going to increase the ways of bringing people back to school, either on a continuous basis or, 
or from time to time in their adult life, and we're going to have to stop worrying about strictly vocational things for people who are supposed to do something bigger because those vocations may not last. Today's computer programmers may be the first people to be technologically unemployed. No, I'm serious because uh, this is a field in which today we're doing by brute force uh, uh, things which we shouldn't have to be doing that way and this field is going to move on too and there's a large comfortable body of semi-professional people who are going to either have to straighten up and fly right, go up, or go sideways into something else and so that the computer field itself is going to have this. Yes? At present, we have education in the humanities, perhaps professions, and some trades. Uh, I think that you can visualize a day when we'll educate people for leisure and educate other skills besides the humanities. I think that the person who is studying for professions must have other skills that can work with a hand. We need psychological education. And I think, Absolutely. as you mentioned, we ought to have some sort of uh, uh, perhaps if we have a four-hour, a four-day week, perhaps one day a week we go to school and learn right. adjustments and, and skills and fun. Uh, as of today, uh, most of the leisure occupations are very haphazard. Uh, I'm in favor of op offering that opportunity. I'm not in favor of making such attendance compulsory. Yeah, I'm, uh, I don't think compulsory. Uh, I know what you mean. Yes, and I, and I agree, and I think that going back even to primary schools, we do have a principle that education is for living, and whatever living means, it means leisure today as well as working. Yes? I hope this is in your field. What do you feel is the prognostication for the next six years? Just more speed and more stories? In computers, specifically? No, I think there'll be more exciting things than that. I expect to see rather large networks of facilities in which, uh, oh, I hate the word, man-machine interaction will take place at a great rate. You know what I mean. I mean that today we have processes going on in the machines and they're rather distant from people and I think they will be brought closer to people's requirements and relationships and please don't interpret this as a psychological relationship or as uh, any other kind of empathy. I'm thinking in terms of a research worker who may be able to use the machine as an extension of his blackboard and scratch pad. I'm thinking about laboratory and classroom use of a facility which at the same time is being used by 200 other people and nobody's interfering. This is the kind of thing. Now does that help? 